has lacked some stars for some time now, Stephen A. Uh, do you believe Zach Levine's performance put the dunk contest back on the map? No, I do not. And that is no knock against him. He was absolutely sensational. There was no question about it. It was a breath of fresh air uh, to see his athleticism, uh, to see the kind of shine he brought to himself because, you know, his agent, super agent, Bill Duffy, had been pointing it out for quite some time what this brother brings and what this young brother brings to the table. And I believe him. He's got a lot of hops, a lot of athleticism, got some swag to him, wants it badly. Is it considered to be in cruise control sometimes? like an Andrew Wiggins is, even though his star is beginning to shine as well, at least uh, sporadically based on what we've seen from him from time to time. Um, but when I look at Zach Levine and, you know, elevating and putting it between his legs or behind his back, as spectacular as that was, number one, I've seen it before. And number two, as great as he was, it was really residue from what we saw in the past, in recent past, that elevated his stature. We've been so disappointed in what we've seen from previous slam dunk contests with dudes missing 13 to 14 dunks, don't seem to know what they're doing, don't seem to have a plan they can execute, et cetera, et cetera, that Zach Levine was a breath of fresh air. What we saw from him, we expect to see from every dunk contest. And the fact that he gave that to us was a beautiful, beautiful thing. But was it innovative or something new? No, it wasn't. It was it was spectacular nonetheless, incredibly impressive, and nothing should be taken away from him. But what he did was remind us, number one, of what dunk contest should be, and number two, what it customarily is not, year after year after year. So maybe in some people's eyes, this is the beginning of something new. To me, the other candidates that I saw uh, didn't compare to Zach Levine. And as far as I'm concerned, unless you can show me a bunch of folks that's going to come up and be just as impressive, all we did was discover one dude and his marvelous athleticism and the gifts, God-given gift that he obviously has, and he's given us something to look forward to as it pertains to him. But he by himself does not elevate this slam dunk contest. Not by a long stretch. We need some names up in there. And also, we need some dudes who know how to handle the rock, by the way. All of this holding it and throwing it off the <laughs> backboard or having somebody hold it for you. I mean, Michael Jordan and these boys dribbled the basketball and made moves based off of that, too. So I think that we need to look at it from that perspective as well. Thank you very much for saying that. I must admit, I am shocked by your take on this. I I'm proud of your take on this. I thought you might go oh, prisoner Lord. of the moment gaga over Zach Levine and say, yes, he has single-handedly revived the dunk contest, but I am with you. It still left me a little flat. And I must admit, even going in, I've never been less excited by a dunk contest field than I was by this one. Stephen A., can you explain to me after you watch the dunk contest how Mason Plumley got in the dunk contest? <laughs> I, I was just dumbfounded by that. I felt sorry for him. And the Greek, the, the Greek freak, oh my God. you know, he's 6'11". It's hard for tall guys to dunk and, and be really clever and creative in midair. So that didn't do much for me. And so for me, the, the highlight of the night was when Oladipo came out and sang New York, New York, and he's got a really smooth, sweet voice. I was shocked by his voice, but it's not the slam sing contest. So, you know, he had one good dunk to start off with, and I thought he had a slight edge maybe after round one, but here came Zach Levine, and I'm with you. I don't want to take anything away from his athleticism, his skywalking, his ability to rise and shine. But Stephen A., you, you said that when he was at UCLA, you thought he was a little held down, maybe a little overshadowed by Steve Alford. I, I didn't get that. It, I, I'm with you. I need a star. I need a bona fide star to, to revive the slam dunk contest. And, and I've watched Zach Levine quite a bit this year so far. I realize he's 19 years of age, but so far he's averaging for the T-Wolves. Plays 27 minutes, so it's it's not like he's not getting some run, but he's averaging 7.6 points, 
a couple of rebounds and three assists a game, I, he's struggling. And again, he's a kid, he's a teenager, but he's struggling. And it reminds me slightly, and I'm not putting him quite in this category, but remember two of the previous three years, you had Jeremy Evans from Utah win it. He's averages for his career 3.7 and 2.7 rebounds. Terrence Ross uh, won it obviously uh, last year for Toronto. He averages nine points this year, 2.7 rebounds. So these aren't great players. They, ca they can't translate their slam dunking into their abilities to dominate basketball games. So to me, I sat back and just said, man, I don't know. I I've still fallen out of love with the dunk contest and in love with the three-point shooting contest. That, uh, that's where I'm at. I mean, I was incredibly excited by that three-point shooting contest, and to me, that was the highlight of the night, not the slam dunk contest. Thank you. Yeah, Levine. I'm with you. And, and just real quick to, 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 to carry real quick, just yeah. to drive home that point, do, do you re I, I wrote this for .com the other day, how the three-point shot has just consumed the NBA the last four or five years. Do you realize last night that they shattered ever, every all-star game three-point shooting record that, that by by 18 makes, they beat the record, and by 33 attempts, they beat the record. 51% of the shots taken last night in the All-Star game were three-point shots. They love to shoot them. We love to watch them. Levine scored a perfect 100 in the opening round, and to win it all, which didn't take much, he had a 94. Zach Levine, if you're watching, let's get an eight clap. Coming up next, Jim Harbaugh says the 49ers let him go. Not the other way around. Why is that? His words are next. All right, so he didn't leave the 49ers. They left him. Jim Harbaugh said leaving San Francisco. They are not mutual. Alex Smith, former 49er and now Chiefs quarterback, says uh, he was surprised that Harbaugh and the 49ers couldn't work it out. Harbaugh led the 49ers to three straight NFC championship games and won the Super Bowl appearance, but they couldn't work it out. I'm saying that with a question mark. Uh, Skip Bayless, what does this say about the organization? I'm not sure what it says about the organization, but I do believe, Stephen A., that what Jim Harbaugh said publicly about this was disrespectful to and unfair to the University of Michigan, for which he now works. It, it just seems like he's now saying, oh, I, I really didn't want to leave the 49ers. They pushed me out the back door. And it comes across like, well, I was pushed into a position of having to return to my alma mater, the University of Michigan. And I don't think that that's going to sit real well with the people who pay his new salary. That's number one. I, I do understand, it, it, to Alex Smith's point, it is hard to understand how you could run off a coach who in his first three years got you to NFC Championship games three times, and you did win one and got to a Super Bowl and barely lost that to the Baltimore Ravens. I, I get that. It is hard to fathom. But I, I also think that when I reflect back on what I went through in Dallas, Jimmy Johnson getting fired after winning Super Bowls for Jerry Jones, I, I knew from the inside out, Jimmy just couldn't work for Jerry anymore. He was burned out. He needed to start fresh somewhere else. He just couldn't handle it. And maybe it was with the, the same with Jim Harbaugh. Maybe he just couldn't get along with Trent Baalke and Jed York anymore, and he made it such that they had to say, we just can't do this anymore. So I'm sure there's both sides to a story here, but I don't like it that he dredged it back up for the sake of the University of Michigan. Well, I totally disagree with you um, in terms of uh, you believing that it was disrespectful to Michigan. The man was just being honest. Everybody and their grandmother knew that he was being forced out as coach of the San Francisco 49ers. It's an NFL franchise. Uh, an NFL franchise with a championship pedigree, an uh, NFL franchise that he had taken the three consecutive NFC Conference title games before last year, and a Super Bowl berth, and it's the NFL. Who didn't know that he would have preferred to stay with the San Francisco 49ers as opposed to going to Michigan? Michigan would have to be blind not to know that. That's point number one. Point number two, with considering the year that they had under Brady Hope, particularly last year when they finished 5-7, and seven, uh, the Michigan Wolverines don't need to be worried about whether or not Harbaugh indeed would have preferred the 49ers over them. They need to be thanking their lucky stars that he chose to come and coach them because he certainly didn't have to. With his resume as an NFL coach, 
there were other, there would have been other opportunities for him on the NFL level. Uh, when you consider the jobs in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, etc., there were there were some ideal uh, landing spots for Jim Harbaugh to coach an NFL franchise, but he chose Michigan. So all of those things being considered, I'm not concerned about their feelings. They're very, very lucky to have them. They should be thankful they have Jim Harbaugh. And to me, this is entirely about the San Francisco 49ers organization. Tom Sula, whoever he is, is your new head coach. For a while there, they didn't have an offensive or defensive coordinator, didn't seem to know where they were going. Right now, there's still some question marks as to who they are and where, indeed, they will be going. And it seems to be that Ned York, along with uh, Blanky, the general manager, uh, because of egos, because of their personal opinions uh, and feelings, may have very well put this franchise's future in jeopardy. All I can say is that Tom Sula, he better win. Because if he doesn't win, Balky and York are going to feel the heat of the locals in Northern California because what they allow to happen is, is nothing short of inexcusable. Okay, I hear what you're saying. I agree with your final conclusion. But remember, it was portrayed that Harbaugh wanted out, that he couldn't stand working for them. He was clashing with the GM. So don't then reverse field and try to tell me, no, I wanted to stay. They pushed me out. He, he's basically saying he got fired when he wanted to stay. That's not the impression we were given. Um, that's not true, Skip. We were given that impression. What we were also given was that he and Balky couldn't get along. It wasn't that he wanted to leave. Nobody said anything about Jim Harbaugh wanting to leave. It was that he and Balky had a contentious relationship. They couldn't see eye to eye. And clearly York and the hierarchy within the San Francisco 49ers organization chose the GM over the head coach. It's that simple. But it wasn't something about Jim Harbaugh wanting to leave. It was about how his relationship with upper management, and particularly Balky, was not the greatest. That was what we were hearing, not that he wanted to leave San Francisco. Okay, so I think we would both agree that the one thing they do have going for them now is that our guy Eric Mangini is the defensive coordinator. <laughs> That's right. They have that going for them because I think he'll do a hell of a job. Agreed. Here, so here. Here, here. Um, and Jeannie, we miss you. Coming up next, DeMar DeMarcus Cousins says he doesn't respect Charles Barkley. Why is that? Uh, we will find out right after the break.